Hello and welcome to the Eve Reader Podcast. My name is Zendane and this is episode 55, Escape. The ship seemed to Gavis to be carved from pure, white-glazed ice. Its poised sheen mocked the utilitarian surroundings of the Kaldari hangar bay, yet standing at the observation deck, Gavis felt like his own faded, worn clothing was rejuvenated in the reflection of the small frigate. The wave of hope which seemed to flow from the hull of the ship seemed so alien after so long that he had to fight to restrain himself. He sipped on his emotions with a fearful pleasure, a starving man barely believing the feast within his reach. Heavy footsteps approaching behind him brought Gavis out of his reverie. He turned quickly. His military uniform still demanded respect and was certainly the smartest clothing he owned, but he was painfully aware of the worn fabric at the cuffs and the fraying edges at the back of the long coat. This ship might be his last throw of the dice, but there was no need to advertise the fact. He was a Marian nobility after all, and whatever his own government might think, his family still had some honor to protect. The tall Kaldari merchant who strode up to the viewing chamber smiled broadly as Gavis turned. Nothing like a sister's vessel, is there? Whatever else you can say about those religious freaks, they kept the good design taste from your empire. Gavis kept his face resolutely neutral. The sister's humanitarian beliefs might be a heresy in the eyes of the theology council, but he disliked the man's casually implied dismissal of all religious beliefs. The religion of the sisters was still partially a schismatic branch from the Amarian church even if no one truly understood the extent of their beliefs these days, beyond an obsession with the Eve Gate and mankind's Terran ancestors. The merchant wasn't wrong about the ship itself, though. The Astero-class frigate in front of them was more functional and angular than any Amar craft, with few of the gentle curves of the executioner he had flown in his recent navy days, but it retained a deeper hint of arrogant style, which drew the eye as only an imperial Mar designs could. In its glossy white confidence, it almost seemed like a floating piece of warship that the Theology Council themselves would have been proud of, although it was probably a purer church than any place where those men preached. Gavis shook himself mentally. It was time to leave those thoughts on the dock where they belonged. She's fully fitted for scanning and exploration. Everything and more. Only their god knows how they do it. But the sisters even managed to get a cloaking device in there, as well as getting it running under warp. How you do that in a ship that size is beyond the wits of any engineer I've ever spoken to. However they do it though, there's nothing better for diving into wormholes, if that's what you have a mind to do. Beautiful as it was, Gavis could think of a few things better. A slightly larger vessel maybe, or at least a few slaves to crew it with him. But bigger ships and space train slaves cost isk he no longer had. For now at least. Beside him, the merchant was still talking. Of course, an experienced navy capsuleer like yourself probably doesn't care too much, but these things all come as cross-capsule designs. Means you can always get out of your capsule and fly it around manually if you want to add some spark to that immortal life of yours. Yes, the sisters don't trust you capsuleers enough to give you the only means of control. There it was again. Many of the established religions had difficulties coming to terms with the immortal natures of the capsuleer technology. The sisters of Eve were hardly alone in that. Gavis knew only too well the difficulty of remaining committed to the idea of aspiring to eternal life in some abstract heaven when your mind could now be saved in a databank twice the size of the pad the merchant was holding out to him. Gavis turned and took the data pad, trying to take his mind off the thoughts of religion. Those days were long gone now. He began to scan the fittings installed on the ship while the merchant watched him with a faint frown, no doubt bemused by Gavis' lack of response to his questions. Frowning, his demeanor turned more serious. You know, lad, I've seen plenty of folks pass through here looking to find their fortunes out there in the unknown regions. You ever stop to wonder how so many fortunes ended up lost there in the first place? Gavis restrained himself from mentioning that the augmented mind of this lad probably held more knowledge than the merchant could have acquired in ten lifetimes, and focused on the ship's schematics which rolled across the data pad. The taller man watching him sucked his teeth and shook his head. You want my opinion? Wormholes are where you go to lose things, not find them. With a click, Gavis abruptly switched off the data pad and finally looked up. The ISK is in your account. Thank you for your assistance. The Astero was almost silent as it slid through space. Floating deep in his capsule, Gavis adjusted to the feel of the vessel. Like its exterior, it was both familiar and strange, but its systems reacted easily and lightly to his thoughts. When you were attached to the capsule, you felt and saw as the ship. Optical sensors fed exterior views directly into your cerebral cortex. The engines and navigational computers reacted to your thoughts as easily as lifting your arm. The frigate might be small, but it was vast in comparison to the human body. 
Yet right now, his arms were the curved struts of the stabilizer rings, his legs the powerful warp engines. It was a transcendental experience. Not for the first time, Gavis wondered how the Amar priesthood would feel if they could experience something like this. His mind brushed across the diagnostic systems, scanning probes, the data analysis and hacking modules, the warm, reassuring bulk of the idling afterburner. The only system his mind seemed to unconsciously skip over remained the cloaking device. He had checked it, ensured that according to all available information it was fully operational, and swiftly moved his mind along. Whatever else was familiar, that device remained strangely alien to him. He reassured himself that it took time to adapt to all new ships. Given time, he would certainly become more comfortable with it. In the meantime, it was merely prudent not to play with technology he didn't understand. The wormhole his probes had detected a few jumps outside of the Kaldari station rose up in his view as the warp drive decelerated. It was hardly Gavis's first encounter with the anomalies, but there were few even among capsuleers who didn't get a little apprehensive at the sight of the giant whirling maelstrom of colors that was a natural wormhole. Fickle, unstable, and downright dangerous, there was a reason the great empires relied on warp gates rather than these cosmic anomalies for transport across the galaxy. You never knew where a wormhole might lead, Gavis thought. You could leap unimaginable distances and emerge in the center of a war zone, or the largest, most populous planets of the known galaxy. He could pass through this gate and find himself next to Amar Prime itself, right in the arms of the very people who had already taken everything from him. He shook himself mentally. The odds were billions to one. Most likely, and hopefully, it would lead him to some unknown region of space, to those areas untouched by the great empires. Out there, beyond the reach of warp gates, it was rumored, lay the remains of great empires of before, perhaps even Jovian artifacts and relics, alongside the hidden treasures of great pirate groups, of blood raiders, rogue AIs, and worse. Out there, maybe, lay the ability to redeem everything he had lost. Out there, maybe, was a new life. The frigate systems felt Gavis's thoughts through the capsule and eased towards the wormhole. As he rode the initial gravitational waves of the hole like a sun surfer, Gavis almost felt as if the ship itself was willing him on, into his future. Then, without a sound, they fell into the unknown. The emergency alarm jerked Gavis from rest. Proximity alarm, the third time today, or the fourth. His mind scanned the readouts instinctively. Nothing, a false alarm, just like all the others. Gavis ran the directional scanner again, rechecking, even narrowing the arc of the scan to probe specific directions which seemed suspicious. Nothing. He had run diagnostics on the entire suite of systems four times now. There appeared to be nothing wrong with the directional scanner. His scanning probes, he knew, were working fine. The small stash of artifacts and salvage in his hold were proof of that. Yet scanner probes couldn't detect potentially hostile ships. For that, he was reliant on the scanner. The damn unreliable scanner. Gave a sigh and cursed the Kaldari merchant. He checked the cloaking device, his mind now slipping so easily over those alien commands. Still active, the ship hung motionless in dead space, hidden behind its cloak, while the remote probes did their work. He was as safe as it was possible to be within wormhole space. Maybe it was time to take a break. With a groan, Gavis began to remove his mind from the ship, disengaging his neural interface connection and draining the fluid from the capsule which held his body in suspended animation while he was in command of the frigate. In his time in the military, Gavis had never left his pilot capsule while in space. Away from the capsule meant away from the neural burner which would preserve and transmit his mind to his clone in the event of death. Away from the capsule meant a step closer to mortality, not to mention being stripped of all the heightened control and sensitivity which came from the direct neural link with the ship. Outside of his capsule, Gavis was limited to reading instruments manually from screens, like a slave crew member. Yet he couldn't stay connected to the ship indefinitely. This was his eighth consecutive wormhole, or his ninth. At least a week had passed since he had undocked the ship at least a week, with no human contact beyond the repeated false alarms of the directional scanner, if they were false. As best he could tell, the directional scanner was simply malfunctioning, but other signs were difficult to explain or to ignore. Wrecked ships with obvious salvage marks, plasma cut holes in the hole too precise, too exact to come from weapons fire. Empty cargo containers marked just days ago, floating abandoned in empty space. Gavis tried to put that out of his thoughts as he eased his body from the capsule and began to move stiffly towards the small area which would have been the crew's galley, if he had had one. Remains of the capsule fluid clung to his body, but it wasn't worth the effort to clean it off. This would only be a short break. Around him, disconnected from his mental control, the ship continued to hang motionless in space, systems methodically scanning the solar system around him under the protection of the cloak. Stretching his legs onto a low bench in the mess after his shower, 
Gavis took the small drinking vessel provided by the automated dispenser and stared blankly at the sterile white walls. The glossy brilliance of the exterior was replicated throughout the ship's interior fittings and was almost blinding in its purity. In a way, it was comforting. You saw everything, no shadows, no dead space. So unlike the void outside, where you never really knew what was surrounding you. Here, everything was simple. Here, he had a simple chamber of heaven in that dark expanse out there. Here, he would find some peace. He ran his fingers over his short cropped hair and let them linger slightly at the socket at the back of his skull. His connection to the ship, to his immortality, his salvation, and his damnation. It had been years since he had completed the training, years since his first death and rebirth into this clone body, complete with the implants and modifications required to pilot a capsule. It had been such a thrill to realize he was one of the elite, one of the immortals, until he had seen the looks, heard the whispers. A religion as dogmatic and strict as that of the Amarians had always struggled to accept this technology which lifted men to the status of gods. Within Amar, only the royal family should have that transcendental status, and yet they themselves were forbidden from using cloning technology to preserve the sanctity of the bloodline. Capsuleers, then, were infidels, apostates in the eyes of many of the conservatives of the church. Unfortunately, given the unavoidable military advantage of capsule pilots, the clergy knew better than to push their views too far where their interest of the Empire's security was at stake. Yet if they stopped short of outright condemning them, the conservative community in Amar society had quickly made it clear where someone like Gavis stood in its hierarchy, regardless of who his family was. The celebrations of his ascent had been tainted with what was almost pity. His service and sacrifice for the Empire was honored, but he could still remember the sense that in the eyes of his friends and family he had given up far more than he had realized. Immortality might be his, but it was not the immortality of heaven which Amarians aspired to. He had, without ever really knowing it, given up his place in heaven for an eternal place in space. Gava stood up sharply. He had been gone from the capsule for too long already. It was two wormholes later that he found the room. The directional scanner warnings that had driven him mad in the first week had slowed in their frequency a few days ago, then abruptly stopped. All his diagnostics indicated the modules were still functioning, but then the diagnostic systems had said that while the signatures were still coming every hour too. Had the scanner been working all along? Had something been watching him and suddenly left? Or had the malfunctioning scanner finally given up its last? Was he truly blind? Fearing the worst, Gavis had taken to the maintenance shafts manually, crawling between connector nodes and relays testing everything he could find. After exhausting every possibility without success, he dropped down the nearest access hatch back to the main interior and stared around in confusion. This was neither the mess nor the empty cabins where the crew would have slept, nor any of the short gangways which connected those chambers. Its dark walls seemed barely any part of the gleaming white vessel, or perhaps the walls were in fact white. It was difficult to tell as the device which dominated the center of the space seemed to be sucking the light from the entire area. A persistent and strong wind whipped across the small platform where Gavis now stood as his eyes adjusted to make out a huge, smooth black sphere in front of him. Twice his height and diameter spun within a stasis web which seemed to be projected from where the walls must stand in the shadows. The spinning device was generating a loud whine, punctuated at intervals by what seemed to be unseen eruptions of energy which cracked against the spacecraft's interior atmosphere. Gavis's mind knew instantly that this device could only be one thing. But if this was the cloaking device, it was like nothing he had ever seen before, either on his navy ships or in any textbook. Staring at the black sphere made the space outside seem practically comforting. He could feel it drawing his eyes in, sucking them in insistently as it did to the small amount of light which spilled from the open maintenance hatch. Desperately dragging his eyes from the device, Gavis stumbled against the railing at the edge of the platform and grabbed it with both hands. There was a small control pad across the railing and he squinted down at it, grateful for anything to take his eyes' attention from the spinning ball. Barely able to make out the surface, he felt along it with his hands. As his hands moved, he felt the hair on the back of them start to rise. What he felt was hard and angular, yet with curved, ridged components which rose out at seemingly organic angles. It felt like nothing else on board the ship, like nothing that should belong on the Asteros' world of pristine white precision. It felt older, more ornate, more primal. In a sudden start of realization, he pushed back from the railing in the panel, which he knew with a sudden but inexplicable certainty was an Amarian altar. Small spots of light began to glow around the room, activated by some switch triggered by his fumbling hands. Tiny pinpricks of light, they did nothing to help illuminate the machinery which underpinned the cloaking device, but like candlelights in a darkened shrine, their effect was still undeniable, as small, select patches of the walls became visible. 
Gavis's darting, unbelieving eyes took in the carved designs etched onto the walls of the chamber, some familiar, some not, but these were unmistakably prayers. Amarian prayers promising protection from the demon. Kaldari prayers to ancient spirits, others he didn't understand. The entire heart of this mechanical masterpiece of a vessel, contained and hidden behind the spells and prayers of a hundred beliefs. Stumbling backward, suddenly gripped by a terror he could barely understand, Gavis grasped for the ladder and dragged himself desperately back into the maintenance shaft and back to the galley. He lay panting on the bench for a minute as his blood slowed and his breath returned. The silence of the ship slowly began to dilute his fear, but the images in his mind refused to fade. He stared at the white walls. Their sterile brilliance now seemed oppressive, blinding. What had seemed calming and clear now only seemed alien, white, smooth, featureless. They revealed nothing and hid everything. It had been years since Gavis had been allowed to set foot in an Amarian place of worship, years since he had wanted to. As his religion rejected him, he had rejected it and dedicated himself to a purely secular service of his empire. Until his family, a prominent ally of the former Empress Sarum, had been disgraced during her death and the rise of Empress Catus. His father had bowed to the perverted, politically motivated wishes of the Theology Council, had thrown himself on their justice, and had died for his beliefs. That had been the final snap of the strings which held Gavis to his old life. He had refused to cast aside his immortality for a religion that no longer accepted him, refused to follow his father to the executioner's block as was demanded by scripture. He had run from his own people, from God and his clergy, sought out his own redemption in the unknown, and yet now, behind the smooth white walls which had promised his salvation, he had found that he had escaped nothing. Was that God's vengeance in that room, or the demon himself? Above Gavis, the red light of the proximity alert abruptly began to blink. He stared at it, frozen. He should return to the capsule. By rights, he should be running for it, plugging in, checking the scans, and readying the ship to fight or flee. Yet every instinct in him now recoiled from that thought. What had the sisters contained in there? What was he connecting himself to every time he lay in that pod? Whatever it was, they had felt the need to wrap it in holy scriptures and words, words which no longer extended their protection to an apostate capsuleer such as he. The proximity warning continued to flash. He forced himself to rational thought. What was in that room was just electronics, just tech. Regardless of what crazed religious scrawls the sisters had covered that room with, it was only a cloaking module. Only. His capsuleer training began to kick in, overriding the continued objections of his conscious mind. Proximity alert. He swung his legs off the bench and ran the short distance to the capsule. As he swung himself inside, he was already preparing the mental instructions that would begin the warp sequence, aligning the ship to the nearest star and powering up the engines. Nothing. He felt it as soon as his mind connected to the ship. There was nothing on the scanners. Again, another false alarm. All around him stretched only black, empty void. Gavis took a deep breath in the confines of his pod and screamed. It had been days now since he had last left the capsule. The last time, a few days after he had found the room, he had found himself staring at every wall, wondering what else lay behind them. He had even turned the lights down throughout the interior, trying to create a little shadow, a little feature on the walls, which might hint at any secrets they may hide. After less than an hour, he had re-entered the pod. The Astero now moved through a cloud of wrecked drone holes slowly, cargo scanners analyzing the remains for anything salvageable, while Gavis tried to focus his mind. He had found this site hours ago. He had hung motionless in space ten clicks out, watching, waiting. Anyone, anything watching would be impossibly patient if it was a trap. He would have to be as well. He had no idea how long he had been waiting. He should have activated the cloaking device to hide his position, yet every time his mind turned towards that instruction, he recoiled. Even now, without it being active, he felt as if his sanity was being siphoned away by that black, spinning void in the hole. He could feel it tugging at his mind. His revulsion of the neural connection to the ship was only matched by his fear of what lay outside. The proximity sensor began to blink once again. Gavis ignored it, probably another false alarm. He had never isolated the problem with a directional scanner. It could be that even that was due to the influence of the room. The demon reaching out through the sphere, intentionally falsifying alerts so as to force him to activate the cloak. He could almost hear it now in his mind, demanding that he activate it to take cover behind its safety blanket of invisibility. Outside lay pirates, rogue drones, and who knew what else. Yet inside lay the arrogant, lying white walls and the hole at the heart of the ship. Inside that room lay the demon. 
The proximity alarm began again, louder this time, closer, more insistent. Gavis felt a cold chill run up his back. The alarm had never gone on this long the previous times. The ship floated powerlessly in space as Gavis's mind froze. There was no real option, no real decision, to cloak meant to survive and anything else meant chancing death. Except not even that would be a true death. Back on the border station where he had bought the Astero, his clone waited. Die here, and his mind would simply leap the light years to that frozen body. Survival would be the simplest thing in the world. It always had been. Was that thin vibration in the ship another vessel approaching, or the laughter of the demon in the sphere? The neural embryonic fluid began to drain slowly from the pod. As the capsule opened up to allow him to step out for the final time, Gavis imagined his own father's face, as he had silently stood before his own inevitable execution. For a long time he had hated that man for that look of peace on his face at the last moment. Behind him, the shrill warning of the proximity alert became lost in a louder rumbling as Gavis's last mental instruction went into effect. The explosion came silently a second later. The dark heart of the ship expanded outwards, vaporizing and twisting the sister's engineering beyond recognition, a dark void racing out to meet the larger one beyond, leaving behind a corona of glowing flame. The wave of brilliant white debris spread across the stars like moonlight through a prism, and between the tattered hole plates and tortured rigging, the empty capsule spun its transneural scanner transmitting static into the void. To the simple AI of the rogue drones who approached the wreckage of the frigate shortly afterward, the single, deceased biological entity was of no real consequence. Their single-minded pursuit of the valuable materials in the Astero's remains left no room to wonder why the capsular pilot floated apart from his capsule. Had there been a more perceptive observer at that point, though, Watching as Gavis's body floated out into the empty space he had dedicated his life to conquering, the smile now fixed on his lifeless lips could only have been described as triumphant. This concludes today's reading of the story, Escape. Hey, Lenore. Should we read them another chronicle? Or which one? That's a great choice. And now, Children of Light. To the Kaldari merchants that shuttled between the core systems, it was considered a good omen if, on approaching the Ayan Orsta Stargate, they might witness the hypnotic ballet of the Lutins. Some Galente locals even took to worshipping these strange dancing lights that would, on rare occasions, surround an approaching ship like a swarm of angels until the jump to perimeter was made. The more belligerent of the Amarian traders, meanwhile, saw them as mere baubles, strung up in space to calm the women, children, and slaves before the warp drive's wrench pulled them briefly into timeless non-existence. Rumors had spread across the border zone of vengeful ghost drones returning from the climatic battle at Ayan Orsta, perhaps to enact a haunting toll for the Kaldari secession a century previous. Conspiracy theorists, as is their way, held that the spectral phenomenon was evidence of Jove experiments. Ironically, it was the dismissive Amarians who capitalized most, on the widening belief among Minmatar slaves that if they witnessed the spectacle of lights, their firstborn son would be blessed with freedom. Despite the fact that the detour sometimes doubled the length of their journey, slaver vessels would divert through the Galente border zone in the hope that a sighting, staged or otherwise, would serve to quiet an otherwise noisy cargo. Some slavers lent the spreading belief further credence by freeing the Luti, the children subsequently born of blessed parents. Others weren't as compassionate, taking instead to neutering their human cargo, often by poisoning the ceremonial Capley bread baked in honor of a Lutin blessing. Whilst a few scientific studies were conducted on the phenomenon, or Ian Pixies as they became known, efforts were half-hearted. Welcoming the income afforded by the increased traffic, the Amar Empire exerted its pressure on the academic community. In the end, even the most inquisitive of academics were dissuaded from seating their sensor arrays around the increasingly busy node. Meanwhile, among pockets of forced migrant Minmatar workers, the legend continues to flourish. Capley bread is still baked by those hoping for release from captivity across plantations and farms everywhere. And in a quiet corner of San Matar, on the darkest day of the year, the Lutinlir, or Festival of Lights, attracts thousands of Luti families now living in the relative freedom of the Amatar enclave. Of the widespread theories put forth through the years to explain the fabled Lutins, the one most favored by the scientific community is that of superheated plasma escaping through poor venting from the Stargate itself. It is thought that if approached at the right speed, correct angle, and proper warp drive frequency, the vented plasma is attracted away from the jump gate's boson sphere and towards the approaching ship. According to the theory, the plasma's reaction to the ship's shields is what creates the brief, dazzling, and harmless display of multispectral lights. 
Over time, perhaps due to advances Jumpgate technology has seen over the years, the number of sightings has dropped considerably. Of the few reports that are made, most are dismissed as elaborate hoaxes. As a consequence, the Ionorsta system has become something of a quiet bypass for traders, as opposed to the highway it once was. Still, every once in a while, a hopeful soul will be seen roaming around the gate, wishing for a glimpse of that fabled beauty. This concludes today's reading of the Chronicle Children of Light. Thank you for listening. If you are interested in learning more about the rich history of the EVE universe, please visit the EVE Chronicle site at community.eveonline.com forward slash backstory forward slash chronicles. Copyright information regarding the chronicles in this podcast may be found at evereader.org forward slash copyright.html. No festival gifts were harmed during the making of this show.